Welcome to the Urban Agenda. I'm David R. Jones, President of the Community Service Society and your host. With a newly conservative Congress and a cloudy outlook for the presidential election, the nation faces many uncertainties. Since my organization's work is to help those in poverty, we are vitally interested in just how political turmoil will impact on welfare and low-income working families. Today we have two guests, extraordinarily astute observers of the national and local scene. They are Les Payne, Assistant Managing Editor of Newsday, and Wilbert Tatum, Editor-in-Chief of the Amsterdam News. Well, gentlemen, where do you think we're going to be going? Uh, what do you think is going to happen nationally? Bill, I'll start with you. I thought you'd do that. Yeah. I think the road map was laid out pretty clearly for us on what is called Super Tuesday. When Dole took all the marbles, but not quite, when the final assessment is that after all of this, he still gets less than 52% of the total vote so far. There's no question in my mind that, that uh, Doe will be the nominee, but the baggage he has to carry with him, and that is Forbes to some degree, but especially Buchanan, uh, gives rise to what I believe is one of the most dangerous times in the history of this country when a man who is uh, avowedly a racist, avowedly, I mean, by somebody else, not he, uh, who is against all forms of, in, uh, of immigration into this country, who is anti-Semitic and anti-black, to be so close to, to have his people ask for a platform at the Republican National Convention and perhaps a vice presidential slot is one of the things that can frighten one to death. And uh, the Republicans that I know and know of are totally unrepentant about a man of the caliber of uh, Pat Buchanan as a leader of our country. I'm amazed. Les? Uh, well, I, I agree with some of that. I, I think that uh, Dole will likely get the nomination uh, of the Republican nomination. I think, though, there's an interesting question as to who we would go to for vice president. This is where the Buchanan factor begin to come into account. Buchanan has said that, for instance, Colin Powell is unacceptable to him, that his people would vote the convention maybe at the time of or before if he should go to a man like Powell. And I think, though, that while you make the point that Dole hasn't uh, received more than 52 percent of the Republican vote in the primaries, and interestingly, even those 52, some of those 52 percent who voted for him said that they didn't really vote for him. They voted for him because either they thought he could beat Clinton or they thought that he was better than some of the other candidates. So there's not what, that was not an enthusiastic 52 percent right. even, and 52 percent <coughs> is certainly not dominant. The other thing is that, however, uh, Buchanan did get 30, 30 percent. He never went over 30 percent, mm -hmm. but he does in fact have a sizable minority portion of the Republican Party. Uh, and I think that they agree with what he agrees with. Right. And uh, I think it is, it is naive of anyone to dismiss him as saying that he doesn't account for much. He, he is a very central uh, core to that party. I think, though, that the interesting thing, uh, in addition to the power factor, in addition to the presidential factor, in addition to, addition to what influence Buchanan will uh, exercise on Dole, the candidate, is uh, Dole's confrontation with Clinton, which I think really, come November, is going to be the, the, the real fight. Uh, with the strong uh, showing by Buchanan, is a Colin Powell vice presidential nomination in the Republican Party a likelihood? Uh, not a prayer. And not a prayer. And there was not a prayer even before, before uh, Powell decided to step down. I remember writing an editorial uh, about uh, Powell, uh, or rather to Powell, when uh, he was being mentioned and he was going through uh, this country like a dose of salt promoting his book. Uh, I said uh, in the title of the editorial, Colin, we hardly know you. And I pointed out that uh, there was much that he had to do in order to make us understand, rather no one understand, where he stands on affirmative action, whether he is a Republican or a Democrat or a liberal or an independent where he stood on the issues that impact black Americans, indeed all Americans, so severely when it comes to unemployment, et cetera. Um, it is not that I was against his running. I was not. But I did not think then, nor do I now, 
that he has a prayer of a vice presidential nomination either. Do you think he doesn't have a prayer to be named or he does not a prayer that he would accept? Um, I would, if I were he, mm -hmm. I would not accept. Do you think they would give it to him? Do you think no, he, that's what I'm No, absolutely wondering. not. They would not you give think it that to him, old not on a bet. Uh, I, I think there is a chance. I, yeah. I, I disagree. I think there is more than a prayer. Uh, I think, though, that there is still a question. I mean, I, I think if Dole really wants to win, it, it, it looks pretty clear. If you look at polls and you look at common sense, that he could provide a degree of winability. However, I certainly buy into the notion that the vice president does not win the election. However, there is no question but that in putting together a ticket, you do take that into account. It's just right. someone who would balance the ticket. I think there is a prayer of him getting the nomination. I think that, uh, I, although I'm not walking away from your position if you're talking about the black community, I think that the black community certainly does not, I mean, th what makes him attractive to the Republican Party is the very fact that make him perhaps unattractive to your readers uh, and unattractive to the black community. That is that uh, his view on affirmative action, although he has stated it in generalities, he is in favor of some aspects of affirmative action. He is not in favor of scrap and affirmative action vis-a-vis -vis Pete Wilson and others. Uh, he has stated his position on abortion. He has stated positions that are anathema to, say, Pat Buchanan. So I think that although he is something of a moderate in the Republican Party, I think that makes him very attractive. And I think that he could really confuse and throw a wrench in, in, into the election. I think, that, I think there is a possibility. Well, well I, I, I must rebut that, but there is no way to prove it. Right. Well, we'll all and see. So yeah, we'll, we'll, see we'll, we'll skip it. Oh, sure. I right. believe that there is not a prayer. I Let, think let's, I let's know America the, pretty well. Right. Yeah. Let's take for the moment that uh, Colin is not there right. uh, and we have a more conventional mm -hmm. uh, face-off. Where does the African-American community sit in, from urban areas in this, can, you know, in this whole presidential debate? Are we even on the screen? as far as both candidates are Well, concerned. I think the problem with Clinton is that, uh, I mean, there was a cartoon, I think a quite an accurate one, which says that we're down to the final four. They were talking about Clinton and Dole, and they had two Clintons and two Doles. They had the moderate Clinton and the, Demo and, and the liberal Clinton. They had the moderate Dole and their conservative Dole. So, I mean, and, and I think that was kind of the final four. So I think the problem with Clinton in terms of the black community is that Clinton is a consummate politician. He has no central core issue that he would stick to. When the winds are blowing and right, blowing right, I think he will ha hang with it. I mean, I, I say jokingly around the office and elsewhere that if Buchanan had gotten the nomination, Clinton would begin to view Nazism in a new light. <laughs> Which is to say, I think he can attack. <laughs> we can. Uh, that is not to say he would come out for it. Right. But he we're probably wouldn't we. speak against it. <laughs> David, we're on both screens, the Republicans and the Democrats, because if either is to win, really, there is need really a necessity for the black vote. And I can see what is happening within the Republican Party itself when they are making an effort to woo the black press of America in more ways than can be named. Hmm. Uh, peop uh, organizations that I never heard of before are sending op-ed pieces so they can get free space. We're getting calls from some agencies of government uh, uh, asking for our advertising rates and what have you. and. Uh, I just find it ridiculous to believe that blacks in America can be so affected by the Republican Party that they would desert the Democrats. And conversely, the Democrats have done little or nothing to deserve our support, and that's called between a rock and a hard place time. But we have to go somewhere that we have got to demand before going in mm. those things that make some sense to us. And the first step in that process is a massive voter registration before, because we can make ourselves the balance of power no matter which way this goes. Well, let's talk about the issue of African-American leadership and on a national level first, and then we should bring it back to the local level. What's happening in your perception uh, to the African-American national leadership uh, centers? Uh, now in wake of the Million Man March, yeah. in, in well, the reorganization were, of the NACP, yeah. where does this all fit? Well, polls taken after, and I think in terms of orthodox political uh, uh, leadership or what passes for it in terms of black, I mean, Jesse Jackson still leads the polls in terms of uh, a leader who has, a, I mean, he got seven million votes in 1988, right. most of them black in 1988. I think that no one has gotten those kinds of, of, of votes. I mean, I think the Million Man March certainly was not an embrace of Farrakhan, even if you look at the polls. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think in terms of, I mean, Jesse Jackson still holds a great deal of sway 
politically. I think, though, that it is at some of the local leaders, not New York, you know, but it's at the local leadership in some of the cities. And, and unfortunately, some of those war horses have been worn down. Colin, uh, Colin, uh, Coleman Young, for instance, uh, in Detroit, who was very strong and, and, and had a base. Uh, uh, Maynard Jackson in Atlanta, who was very strong. I mean, Thomas Bradley, you know, uh, Tom Bradley out in L.A. I think that the mayors of some of these cities, power has been eroded. I think that the, the, what is really happening is that, you know, uh, people talk about this being a rollback uh, uh, as, in, as, as in the 1890s, uh, here in the 1990s with the failure of Reconstruction in the 1890s. I think we're having a similar thing here. I mean, you look at the, 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 the weakening uh, of, the, of the Congressional Black Caucus, for instance, mm -hmm. which is what we are talking about dealing with the core of your question, black orthodox political leadership. The Black Caucus has been, is being undermined by re-redistricting, you know, which is going to diminish its numbers, diminish its influence uh, by what they call the revolution of, 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 of November 4th in 1970. Uh, I, I guess I see all that, uh, but what I'm concerned about, and I've asked this question mm -hmm. a number of times, is I don't see people even taking the, the, uh, make, taking the risks they did uh, during my father's generation when he came about. When my mm -hmm. father came back right. from the war, Tom Jones, mm -hmm, sure. as a first lieutenant, he went up to the Democratic Club and mm -hmm. for just asking to join, they threw him down a flight of steps. Yeah. Well, I, don't not... find, I don't find the kind of risk taking here uh, that we would expect from uh, organizations and institutions that have relatively little, at least physical risk to the, their, themselves or even their livelihoods. You're really talking about the NAACP and the Urban League. And you're also talking about another phenomenon. Uh, let's mention Coleman Young. Well, I thought in terms of the whole landscape, the heroes that we have are either dead, fired, unelected, or compromised. And the most important of these is those who have been compromised. Jesse Jackson himself, to a large degree, has been compromised. How has it been compromised? compromised? Your viewers probably want to know uh, what you're talking about. Compromised in terms of his trying to make a living within the framework of the mainstream, while on the other hand, doing those things that make him acceptable to the body politic, while not taking the kinds of risk that he used to take even when he believes strongly in one thing or another. Uh, when I talk about taking risk, I'm talking about something as simple as making a living or getting promoted to the next level when you're in a Congress of the United States. You're being watched so closely in terms of what you say by organizations that actually monitor the leadership on the black, in the black community and put out studies mm -hmm. of black leaders have said About and what they've done and then putting a spin on it that would make one who is ordinarily fair anti. If That's you're saying, if you're saying yeah. that black leadership uh, con including Jesse Jackson continue to be under attack I certainly not only would agree with that but I think that and we compromise have. Less. Uh, well, compromise is, is, is how they meet that challenge mm -hmm. and how they respond mm -hmm. to that threat. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, J Jesse Jackson certainly would defend himself against that. But uh, laying that aside, I think that, you know, this is a c continuing problem. The, the, the uh, chilling effect that the extraordinary pressure that is put disproportionately on black elected officials is unbelievable. And, is, and, and I think the media cooperates with it. I think, for instance, uh, you look at the Dinkins administration, the kind of pressure that was put on the Dinkins administration, uh, the headboard, uh, uh, Laura Blackburn with a, with a pink couch, $3,000. There is nowhere near the kind of outrage. There's nowhere near the kind of examination. There's nowhere near the kind of scrutiny being applied to the uh, uh, Julianne administration. There just isn't. You know, the question is, where is that watchdog role that we so pride ourselves in and should? On the, Jen Dinkins, on, on the Julianne administration, we, it we, is not there. We were laughing you before. Did, you, yeah. you did uh, talk about media. And I'm thinking of a show on which you appear less, uh, Sunday edition. You have got four people uh, who p appear on that show. And you seem to be under attack yourself constantly by that which appears to be a far right leaning of the people on that program. And the idea of having the news director 
the uh, journalistic, journalistic participant on this show, I believe, is, a, is an outrage. Now, I'm not going to ask you how you feel about it. <laughs> well, simply because, Lawless, simply because I know what it means to be in a position like that. But I'm saying to you that these forms of compromises must send us one day to the point of saying, I have nothing to lose. Let me say to my people what I feel. Let me say to my people what we must do together in order to stop this kind of nonsense that one sees on Sunday edition, where you yourself, uh, Les, uh, find it so difficult to fight well, three or four people at the same time. I, don't, I, I less, must say, I must say, <laughs> you, you're, 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 you have been admirable in, on that show in terms of what you've been able to do to make it closer. Les, do you want to? Well, I, I won't respond to, right. to, to my president. I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know he's a, an intelligent observer. But I will say, uh, going back even farther, one of the reasons right. I got on that show, by the way, is because there were two co-hosts, Jim Jensen and right. Ed Koch. I mean, Ed Koch was a co-host with Jim Jensen when I got on the show, right. and he used to sit there week after week and crit critique the Dinkins administration as if the bridge did not begin to rust until he was elected, until the city did not begin to experience crime until uh, Dinkins was elected. And I thought that that was unbelievable. And so when they asked if I would want to come on the show, I went on to challenge and try to blunt Koch's assumptions and thrust about uh, what was wrong with the city. Your performance has been Admirable. Let, let, let's you, talk uh, closer to home sure. for all our viewers. Let's talk about what's happening in the city of New York. I think uh, I was just down in Washington a couple of days ago, and, and clearly there's a, an imminent cutback in, in yeah. a relatively mm -hmm. small program, which they're cutting out all the summer youth employment slots for right. uh, mainly minority, but right. also majority kids. Uh, I see it's indicative, obviously, of a frontal assault, particularly oh. on children and uh, it is. Yeah, what, what, what do you see as the environment and future for the city, and, and not only in terms of what you see coming down, but what do you see the political reaction from our communities? Less well, I think, I, think that, I think that community has to organize. I think that community has to inform itself. I think it is the role of organs like the one that he is uh, in charge of, the City Sun and uh, BLA, BLS and others, to inform the black community, particularly what really is happening, because unfortunately it is not reflected enough in the so-called mainstream uh, media because they have their own, I mean, some of these newspapers in town, I need not name them, are political organs of the individual private owners who own them. I won't have to go into what they are. You know, you really know what they are. But I would say that I think that the youth in this, that has been one of the major changes, by, by the way, coming from the Dinkins administration to the Julian and Anna administration, is the lack of goodwill toward not just black youth and Hispanic youth, but all of the youth of the city. I mean, from the very beginning, I mean, youth have been under attack. I'll give you one, one recent example. Aside from youth, you take, you take this workfare program. It ver it, it, the, the attitude is a very sinister one. It is one of self-righteousness. It is one of authoritarianism also. You know, uh, you take the workfare program. There is a workfare program now which says that uh, people who are on welfare, who are attending colleges, and, and there are two in Queens, Berman colleges and Queens College out, out in Queens, say that they, these people want to have jobs, true enough, but they want to have jobs near the college so that, you know, if you're going to college, you don't have to go across town into another borough, you know, spending transportation money that they don't have. So they would have to quit college to hold these jobs. So there was an experimental program with 100 students who would get a job near uh, the college or at the college. And you know what they have to do to maintain these jobs, according to the Julianne administration? They have to maintain straight-A averages. It See, is unbelievable. Th this is the kind th of cynicism that This is what we should check back historically. I want to see one of these political leaders meet that great average, who got all these subsidies out of the government. And I think you're absolutely right. This has such an overtone of, of racist attitude here. And that total it, and cynicism. Pernicious. And well, that people I, should rise up at one and, and look at right. that program. I, I want to well, jump in here now. Okay. I think your observations are absolutely correct. And when we say we must rise up, the next question always is, how? how? I had mentioned earlier voter registration, which is the most direct route to change things in a society. But it has to go further than that. Uh, we don't even see our former militants, the people that, people, uh, that white people were scared to death of. We don't see them anymore, it, with the exception of uh, Reverend Sharpton, uh, who make issues out of things that affect our lives so uh, in such a terrible way. We have not held to account even those blacks in the Giuliani administration 
who have compromised our community by their obeying their leader, Mr. Giuliani. But one understands that they can get many, many blacks to fill the roles that Giuliani has so graciously allowed black people to have. We must come back to basis, basics rather. We were once able to organize. Now, it may have been that we were able to organize because we had jobs organizing through the poverty program. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got to understand that that is gone. That is no more. Then we've got to figure out how to do it through our churches, our organizations, well, and to be, do, do it so well to yeah. defeat some of those people that we've never been able to defeat before and to ensure that both the Republicans and Democrats here in the city and elsewhere understand that they are dealing with a potent force. But if we don't demonstrate well, it, who yes. knows that? Let, 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 let me just say that. I mean, I'm a journalist, and, and mm -hmm. I've given my life over to journalism, and I think that's a very valuable uh, right. craft. And, and, and so when I talk about uh, people acting, I mean, I think people informing themselves and getting informed is very right. crucial because before you act, you have to be informed. So I think there's certainly a role in journalism. I mean, I would say, though, that in terms of, you, you talk about voter re registration. If, you, if you're looking, uh, there were a lot of voters registered in this town uh, in, in 1993, uh, and because Jesse Jackson and others, you know, had come mm -hmm. around, and people were registered, but they didn't vote. I think that's what you need to do is to drive up, it seemed to me, not just, I mean, registered voters is fine, but I think those people who are, in fact, registered need to vote. I mean, they are registered voters who do well, not vote. That's and, the and process of organizing. Well, if you begin it, the it, process. It's more than just organizing. If you begin the process of voter registration, then it is incumbent upon you and your organization to make mobilize. sure that you mobilize those people you But they have to have something to, to yes, but they have to have something to vote mobilize for. Them. Well, vote you they can have vote, to have for, something to vote for or you can for. vote against. They have to be excited, they, I mean, and brought to the polls on issues that are critical to their well, community. Let, yes, let's, talk, let's talk about what issues would galvanize our community at this point. And, and well, there are enough on the table well, already. Well, I think education. You, I, I mean, I think in New York City. If you're talking about New York City, right. or you want to talk about no, national? No, let's talk about New York City. In New York City, I, I, think, I think education. I think education is something that if people begin to inform themselves about the failure of the New York uh, public educational system across the board, which is staffed 80% by black and Hispanic kids. 80% of these public schools uh, are, are black and Hispanic children. And I think if they began to go into those schools and begin to find out, or even listen to some of the media reporting, there certainly should be many, many others, how bad these schools are. I think that is one issue that they can mobilize around. I think the whole question of youth job fair, the issue that you raised earlier, is quite another one. And I think politicians have to be held accountable for well, it. Well, you say hold the politician accountable when we don't have a single politician in the city who has any power to speak of in terms of influencing either Giuliani or Pataki or the President of the United States. That seems that that is powerlessness. However, these gentlemen have been elected in their communities. Well, I don't agree with that. And right therefore, right. they have been elected in their communities. Therefore, they should assume part of that leadership to get people to register to vote and then come out so that we can demonstrate that the effectiveness of organizing. And Les said, there has to be something to vote for. Uh, for survival, no matter which way you vote, is something to organize around and to be concerned about. I'm not so much concerned, really, about uh, whether we have anything to vote for or not. If we don't have a job, we have something to vote for. If our kids aren't being educated, we have something to vote for, and that is against those who are currently in power, whether they be black or white. I don't disagree with that. I mean, I, I think that, you know, economics certainly is the key to all of it. And I think that, uh, you know, economic empowerment, you know, across the board in New York City is, 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 is a huge issue. And I think it exists quite apart from, from political empowerment. But I think that uh, uh, Harold Washington made the point, uh, speaking of political power in an urban area like Chicago, and I would right. say also like New York City, he said, you know, what the thing that he noticed toward the end of his days is that that political power was exposed if it was not, uh, if there was not a media in town that was sensible to uh, sensible and sensitive and fair and objective. And he said that the media is hugely important. And I tend to agree with that. And I tend to agree that fairness in the media, you know, is, is all that is required. But I don't think it exists. And I think that is a huge problem. It does, it, it does not exist and will not exist until such time as there is in the hands of black people and Hispanic people a major organ of communication. Uh, we have radio. Well, you have one. I, and I use mine. 
Okay. And I use it every week the Lord sends, but it is not enough. If we had uh, black writers on white newspapers who were allowed to articulate some of the things that appear in the Amsterdam News, then we would have a real shot at change. But you know as well as I, Les, that it is very difficult to get the gatekeepers at uh, these various uh, organizations well, to go so far as to look at things objectively. Let me give you... Uh, I beg uh, to differ. Uh, I mean, uh, I think that some of the stuff that appears example. in your paper... You know, I, I, would, I mean, I'm an editor and, and an executive at, uh, at a paper that we, we not only would, but do in fact, you know, run a lot of that stuff that's in well, your paper. Uh, you I, I think it's, it's less, more, it's more not, complex than I'm that. Le less, I'm not trying to point at your paper. Your paper has been better than most. But the other papers, the white newspapers in the city, have been outrageous in terms of coverage of the black com community. They have, of course, covered the sports. They have, of course, uh, covered all the narcotics and all of the uh, child abuse and everything else that has happened. But in terms of things that would uplift, in terms of things that would guide black people toward a better life for themselves within the framework of this community, they have not done. As a matter of fact, they've done so much to undermine the effectiveness of people who wanted to affect change. I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree with that. We don't unfortunately, disagree Unfortunately, much. I can't, cannot disagree with that. And I think overlaid on that is that uh, wrong-headed notion now that the media is overly, quote-unquote, liberal. And liberal is supposed to mean, um, you know, not what its real right. definition is, but liberal is supposed to mean that they are apparently that there are people who are sympathetic, you know, to the needs of these concerns. And, 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 and my experience from inside, you know, is that the, this is not the case. And I'm <laughs> all when I hear that the media is suffering from an overdose of, of liberalism. It's just not true. Well, what you're talking about is the view of Patrick Buchanan of... Uh, and not just Pat of, Buchanan, of by the way, but, but there are people in this town. I'm talking many, really about, I'm are. talking about Goldberg's letter in the Wall Street Journal in which he said that the, the liberal mainstream media is, 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 is overly liberal. Look, for all our lives, we've got to understand that Goldberg's are everywhere and Patrick Buchanan's are everywhere. As a matter of fact, we sit next to them every day of our lives. And what we must do is to be able to contend with them effectively in order for us to move forward. Thank you both. Thank we you. Americans have the arrogance of success, uh, somehow thinking we're invincible and different from the Bosnias of the world. But our luck may be running out if we continue to destroy our most precious resource, the children of tomorrow, and our cities, we may succeed in doing to ourselves what no other country ever could uh, defeat us. Let us hope we'll come to our senses before that happens. This is David R. Jones for The Urban Agenda. To comment on the Urban Agenda or for more information on CSS, contact Community Service Society of New York, 105 East 22nd Street, New York, New York, 10010, area code 212-254-8900.